Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today um, on our webinar for the media on states to watch in 2019. My name is Marcy Mistrett, and I'm the CEO at the Campaign for Youth Justice. I am going to be joined today by four of the staff here at the campaign. Um, Rachel Marshall, who's our Federal Policy Counsel, Brian Evans, the State Campaign's Director, Jerry Thomas, our Policy Director. As many of you know, the national campaign, or the national, sorry, as many of you know, the Campaign for Youth Justice is a national initiative dedicated to ending the prosecution, sentencing, and incarceration of youth under 18 in the adult criminal justice system. There's some key trends that um, we've been really excited about. One is the movement around states who have raised the age of criminal responsibility. Since we opened in 2005, that number has gone from 14 down to four. By that reform alone, we have seen the number of children who have been prosecuted as adults drop from nearly 250,000 young people a year in the early 2000s to 76,000 young people last year. That said, an estimated 32 to 60,000 youth are still held in adult jails every year. I'm now going to turn it over to Rachel Marshall to talk about progress at the federal level. Thank you, Marcy. So as you might know, the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, or the JJDPA, is the principal federal program through which the federal government sets standards for juvenile justice systems at the state and local levels, providing direct funding for states, research, training, and technical assistance. It remains the only federal statute that sets out national standards for the custody and care of youth in the juvenile justice system and provides direction and support for state juvenile justice improvements. 16 years after the bill was last reauthorized, Congress finally passed the Juvenile Justice Reform Act of 2018, which reauthorizes the JJDPA and was signed into law by the President on December 21, 2018. The reauthorization will have an impact on all 50 states and 60, six, six, excuse me, U.S. territories. But I wanted to flag the change we're most closely monitoring, which is the update to the jail removal and sight and sound separation core protections. Previously, the jail removal protection only applied to youth facing delinquency charges. Under the updated act, states will now have three years from the time of implementation of the act to remove youth, including those certified as adults, from adult jails and lockups unless a court finds it is in the interest of justice to keep the young person in an adult facility. In determining the interest of justice, the court has to consider seven factors, including the age of the, the young person, the physical and mental maturity of the young person, the present mental state of the youth, including whether the young person presents an imminent harm, of, an imminent risk of self-harm, the nature and circumstances of the charges, the youth's history of delinquency, the ability of the available adult and youth facilities to both meet the needs of the particular youth, but also to protect the other youth in their custody, and finally, any other relevant factor the court deems necessary. If the court concludes that the balance of these factors point in favor of detaining the young person in an adult facility, the court must hold a hearing once every 30 days to review whether the detention is still in the, interest, the best interest of justice. It's important to note that the act defines an adult as an individual who has reached the full age of criminal responsibility. Right now, a little more than half of states allow youth transferred to the adult system to be held pre-trial in juvenile facilities, but others will need to change their laws in the next three years, which again, we'll be monitoring closely. One final thing to note is that in instances where a court determines it is in the interest of justice to permit youth to be placed in an adult jail or lockup, then the youth might, may not have sight or sound contact with the adult inmates. Further, a hearing must take place every 30 to 45 days to review placement of the young person, and a young person cannot be held in an adult facility for longer than no longer than 180 days unless the court in writing finds good cause. We've already seen a handful of states introduce laws that embrace these new reforms, and we'll discuss that a little further into our conversation today. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I now want to turn it. Percy. <laughs> Sorry about that. So while the JJDPA was a step in the right direction, there's still a lot of progress to be made on the federal level. 
So I just wanted to highlight a few of the other things we'll be monitoring in the 116th Congress. First, we'll be keeping a close eye on the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention to ensure full implementation of the new reforms under the Juvenile Justice Reform Act. Further, funding for juvenile justice programs has decreased by nearly 50% in the past 16 years, so we will need to make sure Congress fully funds these programs as provided by the reauthorization. We also anticipate several new pieces of legislation will be introduced this year. The Juvenile Accountability Block Grant Program, or JBEG, was authorized under the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Street Act of 2002 and was designed to help reduce juvenile offending by supporting the implementation of graduated sanctions and positive enforcement. Funding for JBEG was zeroed out in fiscal year 14. Luckily, a reauthorization bill, HR 494, has already passed the House at a $30 million reauthorization level, and we hope to see it move in the Senate soon. In addition to the Juvenile Accountability Block Grant, we expect to see legislation to fully phase out the valid court order exception under the JJDPA. This was an exception that was added in the 1980s to the deinstitutionalization of status offenders core protection requirement. Under the Juvenile Justice Reform Act of 2018, there were important changes made to this provision to ensure that the VCO or valid court order exception is truly an exception rather than a rule. However, even with these protections, evidence shows that detaining and incarcerating non-delinquent youth who have engaged in status offense behaviors is counterproductive. Research clearly shows that once detained, youth are more likely to commit unlawful acts, potentially leading to deeper involvement in this system. In recognition of this and other dangers that youth face when they are incarcerated, nearly half of all states have already stopped using the VCO exception. Last Congress, we saw several proposals to eliminate the exception, and we anticipate new legislation will be introduced this year to remove the VCO exemption once and for all. And finally, we also expect Congress and Tony Cardenas from California to introduce legislation to incentivize states to eliminate juvenile fines and fees. Across the country, youth and their families, including many in poverty, face monetary charges for a young person's involvement in the justice system. Financial obligations include fines, administrative court fees, fees for assessments, evaluation and treatment, probation fees, public defender fees, diversion fees, fees for expungement, and charges for the cost of confinement. Those costs lead to heightened racial disparities, economic dis distress, and increased recidivism rates. Eliminating fines and fees will help reduce recidivism and minimize racial and economic disparities. Thank you so much, Rachel. I'd like to now turn it over to Jaree Thomas um, to talk about what's happening in the state level. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. So we are seeing a lot of legislative trends this session. It's very exciting. We have 41 states that have introduced over 200 bills that will impact youth tried as adults. And an overwhelming majority of those bills are positive. Um, and they do reflect our goals of getting youth out of adult courts, jails, and prisons. So a couple of the trends that we're going to talk about today include jail removal, um, generally trying to move youth out of adult facilities as well. Raise the age and beyond, as we as we see states looking even beyond 18 in terms of juvenile court jurisdiction. Uh, transfer, specifically ways to um, ways to eliminate uh, transfer provisions. Fourth, mandatory minimum sentences for youth tried as tried as adults. So states that are trying to eliminate or somehow reduce the use of mandatory minimums on young people. Uh, fifth, restrictions on solitary confinement for youth tried as adults. Uh, sixth, extended protections for youth tried as adults, so making sure that young people have counsel and other things that they might need if they're in adult court. Uh, parole eligibility for youth, uh, for youth sentenced as adults. And then finally, we'll talk about racial impact statements, um, specifically statements that will make it so that any juvenile or criminal justice related legislation um, there's an opportunity to see if it has a racial impact that negatively impacts uh, young people of color. So we're seeing a number of statements on that. So for our first trend, I'll hand it back over to my colleague Rachel Marshall to talk about uh, jail removal and removal of youth in the adult system. Thank you, Jerry. 
So as we mentioned previously, despite the fact that the updated jail removal protections under the JJDPA do not need to be implemented until 2021, a handful of states have already taken action to introduce legislation that embraces the reforms in the JJDPA. As you can see on your screen, Washington, South Carolina, Florida, North Dakota, and Michigan have all introduced legislation that would remove youth under the age of 18 out of adult jails and lockups. We also know that Iowa and Maryland are planning to introduce similar legislation in the near future. In Oregon, there is a bill allowing a council to inspect facilities that hold youth to ensure they are complying with the JJDPA, and that's SB 15. And unfortunately, bills in Virginia, Montana, and Arizona this year that were related to jail removal failed to pass, but we remain hopeful that these bills will be introduced in a future legislative session. Thank, thank you, um, Rachel. I appreciate it. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Brian Evans uh, to talk about raising the age of criminal responsibility. Thank you, Marcy. Um, so as Marcy alluded to at the start of this, there are now only four states that um, set the age of criminal responsibility below 18, specifically at 17. And oh, that is it. Okay. Uh, and um, all four of those states have legislation. Um, under consideration this year to raise the age to 18. Uh, Georgia has a bill. Uh, Michigan has a whole package of bills, a package that moved significantly last year, but sort of ran out of time during the lame duck session and had a lot of momentum and has a hearing on Thursday. Uh, the whole package has a hearing on Thursday. I think you saw that part of the package is actually jail removal, which was on the previous slide. Uh, Texas has a couple of bills, and Wisconsin, the governor has announced uh, plans to, and there's a bill now, to, to put raise the age in the state's budget. Um, another thing that's happening this year is, is states that have recently passed raise the age legislation, those laws are starting to go into effect. So on March 1st, Louisiana's raise the age bill for children committed, con, uh, accused of not crimes of violence, uh, that goes into effect, went into effect March 1st. Uh, in South Carolina and North Carolina, the uh, laws will go into effect respectively July and December of this year. And New York's law went into effect last year for 16-year-olds on October 1st, and this year the 17-year-olds will be incorporated into the juvenile system this October. So we're seeing four states that have recently passed legislation to raise the age are now, it's now being implemented. And um, we're also seeing legislatively some bills to um, for Missouri, the fifth state that recently passed Raise the Age, there's a bill to create a, a sort of a study committee uh, comprised of legislators and agency people and uh, at least one advocacy group. And so that's, that's a good thing Missouri is doing because that was not written into their law. And you see a couple of other bills uh, looking at um, issues connected to Raise the Age in Connecticut and North Carolina. And on the next screen, uh, we were seeing states, uh, the first three states, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Illinois, that passed Raise the Age a while ago, a few years ago, are now looking to raise the age beyond 18, which is an indication that they're happy with the way their Raise the Age laws worked out. So we're seeing Massachusetts raising the age to 20, Connecticut raising the age uh, to include 18 and 19 year olds, and Illinois up to 21. Vermont did this last year, raising the age to, to 20 for misdemeanors. Uh, so this is a new trend that we're seeing that is even moving beyond 18 as a sort of cutoff age for uh, the adult court. And Arizona also has a proposal, and Colorado has a proposal to study the idea of raising the age beyond 18. And I can also talk about, I'll also talk a bit about uh, the legislation to uh, restrict or reform transfer laws, and uh, you'll see a few examples here. Uh, New Jersey looking to expand judicial discretion so that transfer is less mandatory and there's more of a chance to keep kids in the, in the, in the juvenile court. Uh, very interestingly, Florida uh, has many, many laws to fix their transfer system. Partly this is because Florida transfers more kids than just about any other state, but it's great to see uh, a state that's, that uh, you know everything has to be bipartisan uh, there's a lot of proposals to really restrict the use of transfer in Florida. 
So I think that's a that's a big, very significant story. And uh, Florida session has just about started. It just started. Uh, so there's uh, it's going to be a very interesting legislative session in Florida. Uh, Missouri, there's a proposal to raise the minimum age of transfer from 12 to 14, which would seem to be uh, a no-brainer from our perspective. Um, and Kentucky, again, raising the minimum age of, of transfer from 14 to 16, which um, would be a significant change. There is one bill not on here that's sort of uh, an outlier in that it moves in the other direction. That's in Indiana, where there's a proposal to expand transfer to include 12 and 13 year olds uh, accused of attempted murder. And this uh, this outlier legislation is a response to an outlier incident last year, a, a school shooting in the town of Noblesville committed by a 12 year old. Um, but aside from this exceptional case, uh, legislation on uh, limiting transfer is is moving uh, much more in the direction of reducing the use of transfer. Now I'll turn it back over to Jury. All right. So now I'm going to talk about limiting mandatory minimum sentences for youth. Um, we've seen some momentum in a couple of states focused on this issue, um, specifically in Hawaii and Nevada. Um, they are actually looking at how to limit the use of mandatory minimums against youth who were victims of sexual abuse or trafficking. We're seeing those laws starting to pop up. Um, also seeing Nebraska trying to uh, eliminate mandatory minimums for youth with certain classes of felonies while they're under 19. Um, we're seeing a number of states just generally really reevaluating their mandatory minimums um, for the most part, it's been for relatively low-level offenses or drug-related offenses, but we've seen in Florida and Massachusetts um, and Iowa and Missouri and, and in North Dakota as well, we're seeing some, some mandatory minimum-related legislation. So I wanted to put a spotlight on Oregon because they actually have 14 bills as, as of my last count. <laughs> but it's, I believe it's 14 and growing that are related to youth prosecuted as adults. And many of their bills are focused on trying to roll back <laughs> mandatory minimums for, for the 15, 16, and 17 year olds um, who, who are automatically tried as adults. So, so in Oregon in 1994, they had a ballot initiative called Measure 11, and Measure 11 created um, a mechanism in which 15, 16, 17 year olds would have to be sent to the adult court for certain types of felonies. And it also created a series of mandatory minimums for those felonies. And so because it's a ballot initiative, Measure 11 is a ballot initi initiative, it requires a two thirds majority vote of, of each house of their legislature in order to pass. Although I will say that there was a recent um, Supreme Court decision in Oregon that also said that once, once there's that two thirds vote, any further changes to the to those sentencing laws can pass with a simple majority. So we're seeing some significant changes coming out of Oregon, um, and hopefully some passage of this legislation, since a number of young people there are impacted by these mandatory minimum sentences. So next, I will talk about the restriction on solitary confinement for youth and adult facilities. So there are a number of states that have passed bills to either collect data on, on young people who are being held in solitary confinement, so there's more transparency around the treatment of, of young people and other vulnerable populations, as well as states that are looking at how can we restrict the use of, of solitary confinement specifically against youth tried as adults in adult facilities. Um, so in Nebraska, Florida, New York, New Jersey, and Virginia, we've seen legislation focused on this. Um, and I know Florida, I believe they, one of their bills actually moved out of, or was favorably reported out of committee yesterday, I think. So there's, there's definitely some movement on this. Virginia's bill, I believe, passed, so it's awaiting the governor's signature. Um, and, and I want to note that a part of the First Step Act, which passed in December and was signed by President Trump in December, did have a piece around juvenile solitary confinement. And so we, we have a sense that some of the movement around this issue is related, could be related to, to that legislation, um, but we're overall seeing some positive momentum to try to get young people out of those, of those situations. Next, um, extending protections for youth tried as adults. 
So we are seeing a number of states trying to create ways to protect records and, and other things for youth who are tried as adults before they've had an opportunity to have a transfer hearing. Um, we're seeing in Connecticut the attempt to t try both to fill records and also make sure the young people know that statements they make in juvenile court could also be used against them in adult court. So just trying to make sure that, that kids are aware of their rights. Um, in Missouri, there's a bill related to trying to make sure that youth have access to counsel and cannot waive their counsel during a certification and transfer hearing. Um, and then finally, in Illinois, we see a couple of bills related to trying to make sure there's a, there's legal counsel for young people who are charged um, with certain for with certain offenses and, and to make sure they have it all throughout their their custodial inter um, interrogation. So it's it's very it's very exciting to see some movement in in the right direction in this area. So next, I'll talk about parole eligibility for youth sentenced as adults. Um, so we are seeing bills not only that reflect the the interest of eliminating juvenile life without parole. Um, as I as I'm sure many of you all know, there's a, a wonderful organization called the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth that it focuses on encouraging states to get rid of juvenile life without parole. And so we're seeing um, some states that are working on that uh, in Arizona and Tennessee um, and, and Oklahoma. We're seeing some movement towards just getting rid of that and offering opportunities for parole for those extreme uh, life sentences. We are, we are also seeing some positive momentum to not only address uh, extreme the extreme life sentences, but also just the long sentences that youth tried as adults can often receive in a number of states. So New Jersey is doing a lot of work around this issue. They've already actually passed legislation to create a commission to study the constructive life sentences that young people get. Um, but they also have some legislation that's focused on creating opportunities for for young people to have a hearing, to have to have parole opportunities. Um, within you know, 20 or 30 years, depending on um, their offense. We also see um, Texas and Arizona doing some, some similar work of, of really trying to create opportunities for young people who've received long sentences to, to ask for parole. Um, I do wanna also note um, that it's, the work in the states around this issue is really critical because last year we saw that um, there was a, a, a there was a challenge that went up to the U.S. Supreme Court, um, Bobby Bostick's case out of Missouri, um, who received a 224-year sentence for a crime he committed as a young person, um, and unfortunately they didn't take up that case. But that's an example of a young person receiving a, a pretty a pretty long sentence. Um, and and so well, and that's a, that's the understatement of the year. It is it's it's incredible, and we're seeing that happen in in a number of states. We're seeing a number of states trying to challenge this both in the courts and through legislation. So finally, I'll talk about racial impact statements. Um, so we are seeing a number of states attempting to pass legislation that will allow, uh, that will allow legislators to request racial and ethnic impact statements on bills related to juvenile criminal justice um, sentencing and the, and the system in general. So in New York and Kentucky and Illinois, Oklahoma, Mississippi, Minnesota, and Vermont, we're seeing, we've seen the introduction of this legislation. You can see it's a very diverse group of states that are looking at this. Um, and we are, we know that there are a couple states that already have this implemented, Oregon, New Jersey, Connecticut um, and Iowa, which was the which was was actually the first state that implemented this this type of legislation, and so you know it's it's heartening to see this movement. I think what we'll have to continue to do is to see how these laws, as they get passed, how they're implemented, and whether or not they are really um, providing some some assistance in helping to reduce the passage of legislation that could have a really negative racial. Um, disparity impact uh, on their state. And then I also wanted to highlight in New Hampshire, they have a bill that's focused on trying to prohibit um, racial profiling and getting their Department of Corrections to collect data specifically on racial and ethnic disparities in sentencing and offer reject, uh, reduction. So you, we see states not only looking at, well, how can we look at legislation that 
that gets passed, but how can we also look at the practices that we currently have and whether or not there needs to be some, some changes to address uh, racial disparities and sentencing um, of both youth and, and adults. All right. So with that, if we have any questions. Okay. If we don't have any questions right now, um, we'll make sure that you um, get access to this deck. It will be posted on our website at uh, cfyj.org under the media section. And we want to thank all of you for your interest in um, our young people and in, in the reforms the states are um, trying to get passed in order to protect them and um, respond to them in age-appropriate ways. Thank you very much.